Okay. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar hosted by Hearing Loss Association of America, also known as HALA. I'm sorry for the delay. We had technical difficulties. The title of this presentation is Traumatic Brain Injury and Auditory Dysfunctions. Our presenter today is Dr. Sharzad Cohen, lead audiologist and founder of Hearing Loss Solutions. My name is Carla Byer Smolin, and I'm the National Chapter and Membership Coordinator for HRLA. The mission of HRLA is to open the world of communication to people with hearing loss by providing information, advocacy, and uh, support. HRLA provides people with hearing loss with tools for self-help, educates and advocates for the needs of people who have hearing loss, and promotes mm -hmm. the understanding, nature, causes, and complications, and ways to address hearing loss. Um, we offer educational inf information on many aspects of hearing loss from technological, medical advances, coping strategies, hearing assistive technology, and more. HLA provides a wide range of local and national programs, events, such as a walk for hearing. We also have a na nationwide network of chapters around the country that offer peer support, education, and advocacy in local communities. Please see our website, hearingloss.org, for resources on hearing loss and information on HLA events. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our card provider, Whitney Raleigh. Thank you, Whitney, for providing captioning for this webinar. Also, if you have any questions during this presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This will allow you to type a question that we will be able to address at the end of Dr. Cohen's presentation. We are joined today by Dr. Shahzad Cohen, who is the lead audiologist and founder of Hearing Loss Solutions. She is board certified and a fellow of the American Academy of Audiology and Academy of Doctors of Audiology. Dr. Cohen is a member of the California Academy of Audiology and is currently serving on the advisory board of California Speech and Hearing Association, District 7, as a continuing education officer. Dr. Cohen received her Master of Science degree in Communication Disorders Audiology 2001 from California State University, Northridge. She has advanced her training by obtaining her Doctor of Audiology degree from the University of Florida, as well as holding an audiology board certificate in tinnitus management. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Cohen. I'll go ahead and turn this over to you when, when you begin when you are ready. My pleasure. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to do something which is normal in this time of abnormalcy between uh, our members of community. I wish everyone health and it's good to be here. So without further delay, I'm going to start uh, talking about traumatic brain injuries and auditory dysfunctions. Um, if there are any issues with my voice, please don't hesitate to let me know. I want to make sure that I speak clearly and slowly for all of you guys to be able to follow my um, presentation. Uh, since we had the technical difficulty, I believe, Carla, you are the one who has the control of the screen. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, I actually think you, I think you'd be able to control the screen on your side, I think. Uh, not working. Okay, I'll go ahead and just move it for you. Thank you. Okay. okay, so this is the title and we what we are going to do, we're going to concentrate on both traumatic brain injury, give you some signs of what traumatic brain injuries are, and then auditory dysfunctions that are associated with the traumatic brain injuries. The next slide, please. The next slide basically tells you who I am, just in case for your reference. Next slide. So this is overview of our presentation today. I'm going to go through it step by step. And if there are any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So what is a traumatic brain injury? Next slide. In definition, traumatic brain injury is damages to the structure or the physiological function of the brain uh, due to an external force. So basically, any kind of a head trauma, if it is strong enough, could be causing a mild traumatic brain injury. 
So, and traumatic brain injuries are categorized in order to better serve uh, the medical professionals to understand what aspects we are talking about. So we have a mild TBI, which is the same as concussion. And that could happen simply by a child, a young child falling off of the bed. Then we have a moderate TBI and we have a severe TBI. Severe TBI are the ones which we sort of consider with subdural hematomas, contusions, or other structural damages to the brain. Next slide, please. So the, the, the basis for diagnosis of traumatic brain injuries are basically neuroimaging. The kind of imaging that we use is either a CT or the conventional MRIs. And these two modalities are usually what <coughs> is used. Can we go back, please? Sorry. It's what, usually what is used to diagnose uh, the structural damages to the brain. However, as we go through life and we see patients, we see that in 10% of patients we who do CT and 30% of patients who actually have an MRI done, a mild TBI are not observed because in cases of mild TBI, there are no structural damages to the brain. So pretty much we are going to see a manifestation of a traumatic brain injury rather than seeing a physiological abnormality. So what I want everybody to take from this slide is damages could be there even when it, could, it cannot be documented through imaging, uh, Im imaging modalities. So not necessarily because we can, imaging does not show uh, damages to the brain or the structural damages to the brain or cortical parts of the brain, that doesn't necessarily mean we do not see any problems. Next slide, please. So this slide is basically what uh, clinicians or even physicians use in diagnosis of traumatic brain injuries in absence of any damages, any CT or MRI damages. Uh, I'm going to read them and explain each one as we go through. Loss or decrease of consciousness. So if someone falls and even for momentarily they lose, the, they think like they, they have lost consciousness, or they think, you know what, I blocked out. That might be one of the reasons. Loss of memory of what they were doing before or what happened after the incident. Alternate alterations in mental state. Uh, dazed, confused, disoriented, emotional, and crying all the time. So, or you ask them a question and they cannot formulate an answer for you. Neurological alterations in motor coordination, if there's any blurred vision, double vision, the loss of balance, vertigo, difficulty speaking, or incoherent thoughts. So when they go to explain something to paramedics when they arrive there, or when the mom goes to pick up the child that has fallen and the child cannot explain what's going on. These are all good signs. If there is nausea or vomiting, for the next 24 hours following. If there are obviously any lesions around the head or the neck or bleeding. Fatigue and lethargy or sleepiness in the 24 to 48 hours, excessive fatigue and lethargy if in the 48 hours following the incidents. These are all signs. And I want again to bring attention to that not all these signs need to be shown as a group rather than even one or few of the symptoms. If they show, these are the signs. Next slide, please. The statistics are what is very, very interesting. You are going to see that 2.8 million cases of TBI are reported annually to hospitals. And then we have so many of them which are not even reported. The pediatric cases, 8,037. It's amazing. 
So I, I put the statistics here to bring attention that the number of reported cases is unbelievably large, even though the little reports do not even, the, the little incidents do not even get reported. And one more thing is that we have 230,000 cases that get hospitalized, but in comparison, the mortality rate of TBI is very, very low. It's only 50,000. Next slide, please. Okay, so the leading causes of what could be traumatic brain injury. We have falls of any sort, falling off of the roof completely to falling off of the bed, motor vehicle accidents, sports trauma, assault, which could be, uh, you know what, uh, getting robbed simply, stroke and other neurological disorders, and the most recent uh, TBI cause, which unfortunately is seeing major in, is majorly is in our veterans, which are coming back from the war. And these are called blast injuries and TBI. And I am going to uh, talk about this in a little bit more detail in a couple of next slides. Next slide, please. All right, so what is the pathophysiological model of TBI? This basically means why TBI happens. What happens to the brain that we have traumatic brain injury? Uh, so as you can see through on this slide, our brain is floating in a liquid, but in an encased skull. So when we have a blow to the head that causes the brain to get a jolt in our closed skull, we can have the brain structure, which is very, very soft, as soft as possibly, as soft as butter, I would say. We could have damages to the structure of this whole uh, this whole brain that we have in our skull. So what happens is that not only when we take the hit, rather the counter blow. So when something comes, as you can see, the baseball is hitting the right side of the head. But if that baseball is moving so heavy and so fast, not only the location of the hit is a problem, rather, be rather because there is uh, physically, there is a counter blow, which is, means the head gets pushed to the other side and then comes back to the location that we started. That is the major problem. So we have a major problem to the right side and to the left side with the counter blow. Next slide, please. So this slide is going to talk about what are the damages which happen. Um, basically, we could have, so our brain has different locations and all these locations are in charge of an activity. So we have the frontal lobe of the brain, which is in charge of emotions and all of that. And then we have the occipital lobes, which the, the temporal lobes, all these lobes, each one is in charge of one activity, one major activity. So depending on which was the location of the blow that we had to the head, we are going to see problems with that activity of the brain. Uh, and the reason that we have this problem, again, remember brain is a very soft tissue. And when we have this blow and counter blow, if you look, we have a nerve showing, our, our whole cortex is all full of nerves and dendrites and neurons. And if you see a very good nerve is shown on the slide, which is the farther left. And you can see a good nerve is basically straight with the nucleus coming out and axons coming out of both the nucleus and at the end, the, the dendritic movements. So if we have this blue and counter blue, not only we have the shape of the nerves changing, which you see in the middle slide, rather you're going to have disconnection or break in the connections that you see in the farther right slide. 
So basically the damage comes because these neurons are not connected or communicating with each other in the way and the shape that they were designed to originally connect and talk to each other. Next slide, please. So again, we're going to sort of review the functions and the symptoms that we see with TBI. So if you remember, we use some signs which are basically for detecting a traumatic brain injury. And then these are the signs and symptoms that we use to sort of, in, even in daily life. So you're going to see a person has inability to think clearly. They have trouble remembering information. Concentration is a difficulty. Re getting information and remembering new information. They sometimes, patients with TBI, have excessive headaches or dizziness through the day. Uh, fuzziness, blurred vision, nausea, vomiting, or even morning sickness could be one of the signs. Trouble with balance, lack of energy, they're lethargic, they don't fall asleep night easily, they're irritable, they have unexplainable sadness or depression, they are anxious, they are nervous. Uh, and then what we can put in the whole group is lack of emotional control and difficulty with controlling uh, their life as it used to be. Now, next slide, please. So we are going, I have categorized all these problems in three different categories. One of them is physical issues that the patient uh, experiences, again, headache. One major one would be sleep disturbance, falling asleep, getting enough deep sleep, or getting up on time coordination problems, muscular issues is another thing that, you know what, our muscles usually need to um, have sensitivity. So if there are lo loss of sensitivity in the hands or in the feet, that's another sign. Uh, if they are more spastic and they cannot uh, do detailed work, that's another problem. Bad taste in the mouth is something which we uh, hear patients report and altered taste or smell depending on the location that the damage was. So these are all physical signs of a mild traumatic brain injury. Next slide, please. Then we are going to talk about the emotional signs of a traumatic brain injury. Remember, depending on if the problem if the major blow was to the frontal lobe of the brain, this social and emotional aspects of the problem would be more dominant. Uh, PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, will be seen in patients. Basically, they would be afraid of doing and attaining more stuff. We have anxiety, depression, anger, short-temperedness, and, and the list goes on and go on and on. So basically any co emotional control will become a problem. Next slide, please. Okay, so cognitive problems are basically thinking problems, and simply said. Um, but any kind of problems that we have when the patient comes to formulate an answer or comes to put an idea into words are the kind of cognitive problems that a patient could be experiencing. Think about concentration, attention, forgetfulness, remembering things, remembering when the meeting was or remembering what they wanted to tell you or how they wanted to explain something any type of abstract thinking of what happened or how did something happen. These are all signs of cognitive problems. Next slide, please. So now this is the part that we get to the audiological problem. So if we are talking to a patient who is showing you signs of either physical signs, emotional signs of traumatic brain injury, you sort of might want to think about 
looking for these little audiological signs. Uh, audiological signs not necessarily are the signs that physicians or psychologists pay attention to in the beginning, because in the beginning of a traumatic brain injury, the major focus is to save the life of the life of the patient or bring normalcy back to the life. So none of the audiological issues are the category one that the physicians deal with. Usually after the patient is stabilized, that's the time that either the patient starts reporting signs and symptoms of audiological disorders or uh, family members start noticing the signs. So I have divided the category of audiological disorders to two parts. To one, uh, 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 signs that have to do with hearing, which is a part of the cochlea, which is our organ of hearing. And the second category is the vestibular, which is our balanced organ. So let's talk about the cochlea. If everybody knows, we do hear uh, sounds after they travel through airwaves to our cochlea, which cochlea marks all the sounds into electrical signals that go up to the brain for interpretation. So basically, uh, the ears are there to type the message to a kind of an electrical message which is understandable for the brain and the real hearing happens in the brain we do not hear with our ears rather we hear with our brain but before the message gets up to the brain for interpretation everything needs to get uh, described or transcribed in the language which is understandable for the brain and that's the job of the cochlea. So hearing related issues that are result of a traumatic brain injury are tinnitus which is the sound that the patient hears in absence of any external sound uh, and it could be of different kinds and we're going to talk about it hearing loss or decreased hearing sensitivity, excessive sound sensitivity means a sound which is normal to you and I, but it's excessively loud to them, decreased sound tolerance means some sounds they are not able to tolerate anymore, feeling uh, oral fullness as if they are traveling in the plane and they need to pop their ears all the time, Loudness of loudness intolerance means even loud sounds they would not be able to tolerate it anymore. And central auditory processing disorder, which I'll explain in details. The vestibular part of which are issues that has to do with the balance disorders are dizziness, which comes and goes, vertigo attacks that could be from minutes to days general balance unsteadiness the patient reports as if they are drunk basically or they are walking on a ship bppv benign proximal positional vertigo which means uh, the patient gets dizziness upon quick head or body movement motion sickness when they are traveling in a car or they are sitting in a car and another car is moving and just a general imbalance. Next slide, please. So this slide shows basically the cochlea, which is the snail looking, the shell of the snail, which you see inside our skull and the semicircular canals, which are three that you see on top of cochlea which think about the tentacles of the snail. I just put this picture for you to be able to visualize that these two cochlea and semicircular canals are part of the same system, but they have two separate functions. Next slide, please. All right, so the vestibular disorders are usually observed 
when we have the dislodging of the calcium carbonate crystals, which basically are sitting in the utricle, uh, a saccule, in, uh, so the copula. So if you look into the semicircular canals, you're going to see a round circle, which we, uh, you see it opened up. So I'm, I'm gonna actually see if I, I don't know if you guys see my screen, but there are uh, basically there are crystals, which we are called otoliths. And these otoliths are the ones which their movement of them, every time we move our head, basically tells our brain which direction our brain is oriented. And if these crystals are not sitting where they usually are sitting, or if they are basically dislodged and they move as we move our head, the signal that comes to our brain is that, oh my God, uh, the head is moving, or, oh my God, you're upside down. So what we have to do in patients who have this vestibular issues is basically do the maneuvers that put the crystals back where they used to be and give it time for the crystals to go back and attach to where they used to belong. And if we cannot do this, that's where we get the BPPV, which usually these crystals are hanging around and moving in the fluid every time the patient moves their head and the report is, I get dizzy every time I move my head. Next slide, please. So the way we talk about vestibular treatments are basically by balance therapy, which comes with uh, PT, physical therapies. So a lot of audiologists currently are not addressing the vestibular uh, therapy portion that is a part of the audiology. A lot of audiologists are just participating in diagnosis of vestibular dysfunctions and our partners in PT are the ones who are doing a lot of balance therapies. Uh, crystal repositioning maneuvers are still being done in audiology, PT is doing it too. A lot of physical and dietary modifications are going to help. Uh, and the list is long and long, and you can talk about uh, with your PT if you need to. Uh, or you could just basically search uh, at Google and you're going to see the list of dietary modifications. Uh, the most important part that I believe in is basically the patient getting used to this feeling and we retrain the brain to the new reality of dizziness. Um, and we call this acclimatization. Acclimatization is when we teach the brain that this is the new normal and then get the grip of this reality. So basically what we do during the acclimatization therapy is to teach the patient, the patient things not to do which causes the dizziness. Uh, don't make quick head movements. Don't turn your head up and down. Don't get, don't get up too fast. Or if you get up too fast, give yourself a few minutes to recover. Or don't get out of bed too fast. Get out of bed in three different ways. Of number one, from lying, go to sitting. Give yourself a few minutes from city, sitting position to go to up position give you a few minutes before you start walking. But then in acclimatization, what we do is that basically in the office, we try to do anything which gets the patient dizzy. And then we try to teach the patient, okay, now what to do, you're dizzy, what to do now? Like one simple fact is that don't close your eyes. If you're dizzy, find a location, one dot on the wall and stare at that dot. If you close your eyes, the dizziness is going to get worse because this is a central problem. So this acclimatization comes with a lot of patients from the patients and a lot of hard work from the therapist side. What I suggest my patients to do is to avoid use of medications such as, such as meclizin or other suppressants because when we use the suppressant medications, we're not giving our brain the time to get over dizziness or get adjusted to dizziness. So every time that we use this suppressant medications, we are delaying the acclimatization. And that's why I tell all of my patients to try to avoid them if they can.
Next slide, please. All right, so these are uh, basically, these are all the signs uh, that we are going to go, um, all the signs now of cochlear issues. So tinnitus is the first and most reported issue with traumatic brain injury. Tinnitus is hearing sound in absence of actual sound, and it could be reported at buzzing, ringing, hissing, humming, anything that you, I have heard it all. So it really doesn't mean how the patient describes it, rather than if they are saying that they hear some sort of a sound where in the environment that nobody else is hearing sound. And this tinnitus could happen if there is a traumatic brain injury in addition to a blast injury. And it could happen if there is a cochlear damage or it could happen if there actually is no cochlear damage. So we see tinnitus with traumatic brain injury when there is no hearing loss present when we do a regular audiometry. And this basically tinnitus, what it does is it affects the well-being of the patient because this head sound is present 24 seven or at times that they need to do quiet work and they cannot get away from it. So this tinnitus is going to affect sleep. It's going to affect reading. It's going to affect speech, speech understanding, concentration. Imagine that there is a sound that you cannot run away and it causes emotional disturbance as well. So tinnitus, this is why tinnitus is a major issue for our patients because it causes problems in social well-being, psychological well-being, and their personal life. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so what we are going to talk about tinnitus is basically now a little bit of treatments that we use. Uh, give me one second, let me try to... Okay, so the most reported, as I mentioned before, the most reported, ten, uh, the most reported uh, with tinnitus, uh, the most reported uh, issue with traumatic brain injury is tinnitus. And tinnitus has functional impact on the, the whole life of the patient. That functional life of the patient gets uh, problematic. Think about this. If we treat tinnitus, which is this sound which is in their head that they cannot run away from, the patient feels less stress. It is easier for them to concentrate. They have improved the speech understanding. They have improved sleep. They have less anxiety reports. They have less mood swings and then they have increased social life. So I, what I want to, for everybody to understand is that tinnitus doesn't only affect the person, rather it affects how the patient and the person is talking to somebody else or reacting or working in the whole family environment. Next slide, please. Now, the treatments that we use for tinnitus, which we're going to mention, and then hopefully next time we present on this detailed information, are of three kinds. We use psychological options to treat tinnitus, we just use instrumental options, and we use acoustic options. So cognitive behavior therapy is usually what is used in tinnitus, and it's like right now, it's a golden standard of treatment of tinnitus and we a lot of uh, audiologists like me we use a modified cognitive behavior therapy because cbt is associated with psychology tinnitus retraining therapy is basically the patient getting 
um, knowledge and facts, scientific facts about tinnitus, and then homeworks in, or emotional work on tinnitus to sort of um, in, to sort of uh, saturate life and give meaning in other ways that the tinnitus becomes not an important issue in the patient's life. TRT was a method which was started with Dr. Jastrobov, who was the lead researcher uh, in this area. Instrumental options are when we actually use an instrument in order to give treatment for tinnitus to a patient. Uh, neuromodulation tinnitus therapy systems are upcoming. Uh, we have one which is on the market, which we are currently using, and there is one which is going to hit the market sometime very soon in the near future. Um, forced habituation acoustic systems are another devices, which most of these uh, instruments are in an iPod form, and there is a medical app installed on that iPod, which the patient uses medical app in order to access the treatment that is programmed by the audiologist. Forced habituation is basically when we uh, program the device in a way that the patient hears their own tinnitus and have to fall asleep to their tinnitus. Uh, so basically the system is forced to shut down and get used to the hearing the tinnitus. So during the day when the patient is not using the device, the tinnitus is already into um, basically into the back seat. No, I'm not going to pay attention because I have already learned not to pay attention to it. Hearing aids are the last resort, which I uh, well I use as a last resort in my office. Uh, I do not like to use hearing aids, especially if the patient does not have a hearing loss. Uh, hearing aids benefit the patient in tinnitus treatment by basically increasing the meaningful sounds and meaningful uh, information coming into the brain uh, in a way that the tinnitus, which is not meaningful, takes the back seat and is not a forefront of attention anymore. Uh, acoustic options are when we use either music therapy or some sort of a sound to, um, surpass, to suppress the perception of tinnitus. Next slide, please. Uh, one note that I want to mention is a lot of people use tinnitus maskers, and tinnitus maskers are beneficial in some patients. Again, my belief, my personal belief, is that tinnitus maskers are like a band-aid relief, uh, especially if they are in sort of a fan sound or white noise or pink noise. I am not a big fan of them, and I believe that basically there is a sound coming which is not interpretable to the brain, which is your own tinnitus, and now you are uh, simply, instead of having the brain hear your tinnitus, you are giving another sound uh, that is not interpretable to the brain. And I, I personally don't like them because um, I believe we should treat tinnitus rather than masking it with another sound. But there are a lot of people who see benefit from it. And um, if you are seeing benefit from something, continue using it. I don't want you to stop something based on just what my personal notion is. Next slide, please. Okay, so traumatic brain injury comes with multifaceted hearing loss or no hearing loss at all. So we can have a conductive hearing loss if the damage was enough to damage the uh, middle ear and the way that the little three little bones, malleus, incus, and stapes uh, work with each other. We can have a sensor neural hearing loss if there was any leakage from the endolymph. Uh, we could have a sensory neural hearing loss if there was any damage to the temporal bone. We could have a mixed hearing loss 
But what we see majorly is central auditory processing disorder, which in abbreviation you will see as a CAPD or APD, um, which basically is the way that the brain interprets the information which is coming to the brain. Next slide, please. So signs of hearing loss, which uh, it's known to everyone, patient, basically the patient doesn't hear as good as they used to hear before. There is misunderstanding. They ask for repetition. They ask for uh, re repetition uh, in different forms, or they miss doorbells, or it, the patient spends more time lip reading. If you talk to them face to face, they hear you better than if you're talking to them from their back of their head or from far. So these are all signs that you know, by paying attention to them would be interesting. Uh, to pinpoint if the patient has any hearing loss in addition to the traumatic brain injury. Next slide, please. Uh, if a patient has a hearing loss in a very mild format, necessarily use of hearing aids which are expensive but beneficial are not sort of are not the primary uh, concern at this point, I would say we can actually assist a patient with a very mild hearing loss by offering them assistive solutions like captioned phones, apps which transcribe, recording devices that they could record a, a, a function or a speech and they can go back and re-listen to it, uh, FM systems which there are, you know, the, right now there are systems which uh, you don't need to have a hearing aid in order to use an FM system. There are just headphones that you use, loops, telecoils, and a lot of other apps which could be used in order to just bring the speaker closer to the patient who is listening. A personal sound amplification system, which are an option for people who just need to see if I make sound louder, do I hear better? Do I process the sound better? These are another options. Next slide, please. If we want to treat a patient who has a hearing loss, the options are numerous. Depending on what is the level of the hearing loss, we could go something as a simple as a hearing aid to add something as complicated as a cochlear implant if we have 100% loss of hearing in one ear. We have right now with the current technology on the market, anyone should take advantage of uh, audiologists who know how to treat hearing loss. Um, bone anchored hearing aids or bone ossified, or ossified uh, hearing aids, all these things are options. Please see your audiologist and ask for um, detailed information rather than just buying something online. A lot of things that I see online are not even good hearing aids that you're spending the money. A lot of audiologists are right now offering information. So think about uh, how hearing loss should be addressed, uh, if it is significant to how it should be addressed, even if it's very mild. Next slide, please. So central auditory processing, I'm going to sort of explain a little bit about it uh, because uh, it's a major issue. Again, we do not hear with our ears. Ears are there to type the message to the brain and the brain is there to interpret. Central auditory processing, it's when the brain cannot interpret the information that is coming in either as fast as it's coming in or in the format that is coming in. Next slide, please. So signs of CAPD is basically communication problems, which sound a little bit like hearing loss. Difficulty understanding rapid speech. Difficulty following speech when a few people are talking at the same time. Difficulty understanding speech in noise. Difficulty paying attention to more than one speaker. Difficulty ignoring noise. Uh, if we are talking about more of a personal level issues, the patient has a hard time retrieving words that they want to say. 
uh, the way that they are going to talk because they have to formulate their thoughts is a slower. Auditory memory, what they want to say, uh, the words are coming at a slower rate. The words that they are choosing are not exactly specific. Um, or we are going to have problems in the background of noise. They, they cannot even think if they are in the background of noise. Next slide, please. So what do we do to treat traumatic brain injuries? It's all oral rehabilitation. Uh, rehabilitation, which basically means you sit with the patient, the, the therapist sits with the patient, and we do therapy one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, after one-on-one -on -one therapy is done, there are treatments which we can actually send the patient because these are called computerized treatments. So the patient can do it at home. Basically, CAPD treatments are all patient-centered treatments. Audiobooks could be used. Music therapy could be used. More uh, specific, there is LACE. Clear, CapDot, Aria, these are all the names which are going to be familiar to the audiologist that you see who knows about uh, auditory rehabilitation of traumatic brain injury and central auditory processing disorders. Audiobooks are very simple. Basically, we have the patient to listen to the books on tape or online. And uh, either with one headphone or two headphones or in background of noise. Um, music therapy is when we actually have the patient listen for lyrics and write down the lyrics. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so let's talk about the acoustic problems, which are hypersensitivity, decreased sound tolerance, misophonia, which is Another name for being afraid of a specific sound or being allergic to a specific kind of a sound like chewing. Phonophobia, which is basically being afraid of sound in general. There are a lot of patients who associate the sound that they hear to the traumatic brain injury that happened and they just cannot tolerate anymore. So all these Acoustic problems are problems that need to be evaluated by an audiologist who is familiarized or has actually specialty in these things. Right now, we do not have a um, specific specialty for acoustic problems, but there are a few in each state who have seen enough patients in this category who um, are is starting to educate about all these issues. Um, so if anybody needs a list of therapists in a specific state, please don't hesitate to ask me and I will be more than happy to provide that to you. But I just want you guys to know that you must see a specialist for these things. Not everybody has the knowledge of it and there is a lot of mistreatment for them. Next slide, please. So acoustic treatments that we use are highly individualized. Basically what we're going to take out of this whole presentation is that the same way as traumatic brain injuries have categories and we have an even from mild to very complicated, you need to see somebody with an audiology degree who knows what they are doing because we need to use a multifaceted approach to treatment of auditory dysfunction as a result of a traumatic brain injury. One uh, issue is that you cannot treat all traumatic brain injury patients the same way. Each patient is specific, has a specific needs and has a specific approach. And what the last thing is that we will need to make sure that it's a multidisciplinary approach, not an audiologist by itself, not a psychologist by itself, and not a neurologist by itself could treat a traumatic brain injury. Treatment of a traumatic brain injury is a multifaceted, multidisciplinary approach because each one of us are only um, certified and knowledgeable in our own area. But when we sit down and talk with each other, in a group format, that's when we see the complete picture of what our patient is missing. 
Next slide, please. So the importance of treating the hearing issues is we hear with our brain and uh, our hearing affects the quality of life. It affects our social interaction. Uh, hearing affects cognition and memory and all of those. So why am I here to raise awareness? Because I want everyone to have a good quality of life. Today, more than ever, we know how our social interactions form us, form our society, and humans are uh, social animals. We need to interact with each other. So if you have or you know someone who is suffering from a traumatic brain injury or has a hearing loss, uh, I want you to sort of pay attention to their quality of life. This is why the mission of HLAA is so important for me, because it's all about increasing the quality of life of someone who is suffering from hearing loss. The quality of life is the most important thing uh, in treatment and in patient-centered care. Next slide, please. So uh, here I'm going to thank all of you guys who took the time out of your day to join me and I'm going to open the floor to questions. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Okay, um, Dr. Karan, we um, have one question. They're asking if someone can get this PowerPoint. Is this something that you could share with individuals that can contact you? If you allow me, yes, because I have some information which is uh, I can, I can take out of it, and yes, I will uh, I will be more than happy to share. So make a phone call. You have my phone number, please. Uh, as far as the slides are not going to be used uh, without my law without my knowledge or HLAA knowledge for another presentation, I'll be more than happy to use to share the information. Okay. I, I don't have any other questions today, Dr. Cohen, so okay. I think we can close out. Um, I thank you, Dr. Cohen, for your time today and the information you shared. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the HRLA website. Please be sure to visit us at hearingloss.org for future webinars and resources on hearing loss. And thank you again to Whitney for providing captions today and for everyone joining us today. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.